Great. Okay. Well, Romans 7, we're making our way through. I'm actually going to cheat a little bit today because um, it's Romans 8, the first half of next week. And 7 and 8, just they, they tie together so importantly that I'm not going to just do 7 today and just do 8 next week. But I'm going to run a little bit into where Paul takes it in Romans 8 this week. And I'll, I'm sure I'll draw on Romans 7 next week. I'm going to treat them as a, as a double bill, essentially. Um, in the process of talking about Romans 7, we're going to end up talking a fair amount about the word law. So I'm just going to very quickly say a, a preface on the word law. Uh, words have a, a variety of meanings and to a native language speaker it's very obvious what those are. Let me give you four examples. Uh, we're redoing our drive, I've lost my drive, I love my daily drive and I've wiped my drive. Okay four uses of the word drive but instantly those of you who are tech savvy will get all four and some of you will be puzzling over what I wiped my drive means. It's not a high pressure washer, it means that you've lost all your files but the fact is, as a native English speaker, we, we understand what those different words drive mean, and, and we don't really need anyone to explain that. When we read law in the scriptures, um, somebody who is familiar with the Jewish setup would instantly understand, are we talking about the, the whole idea of law generally? Are we talking about the law of Moses or, or what? And we sometimes have to do a little bit of translation. Now, hopefully your Bible does that for you most of the time, but you do need to be aware that when the word law appears in the Bible, it's just nomos, and the translators have to work out whether they put a capital L on it and say this is referring to the Jewish law or not. This passage mostly talks about the Jewish or Mosaic law, but I, I just want to name that up front. When you're reading it, if you find yourself going, what, what is this law business? Sometimes read your footnotes, have a bit of a look. What type of law are they talking about? It can mean generally a system of enforced rules. It can be the law in the sense of the law and the prophets, which is how uh, the Jews divided up their, their Bible, their, their scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So it can mean those first five books of the Bible. Um, and it can mean specifically the, the set of 613 commandments that were given to Moses, which were known as the Mosaic law. So we've been reading through Romans 6, and last week we heard that through what Christ has done, we can be dead to sin. And... Caroline finished off her passage with this. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. That's 7 verse 6 there. And this leaves us with a bit of a problem. Paul talks really excitedly about being released from law, about being set free from law. And and this creates a bit of a tension in us in, in which we say, hang on a second, is the law bad? Has God given the Jews something bad that they need to be set free from? How would that fit with him being a good God? And, and Paul goes into this. He's like, no, we need, to, we need to do business with this question. Is the law bad? And first of all, just to give you the preview of the answer, no. <laughs> the scriptures are really clear. Um, that you know, Psalm 119, for instance, says, I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands, because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. Because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold, and because I consider all your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. That's just one little sample of Psalm 119, which is an extensive sort of eulogy of the law of God and how great it is. So we can't end up concluding that the law is bad, but Paul seems to be really anti-law. So what do we do with this? And in order to dig into that, Paul says we need to understand sin. So here you go. Bright, cheery topic for a Sunday morning. We've talked about law and now we're going to talk about sin. But it's important. We, we read a number of different terms in the scriptures to do with sin. And it's important to understand what they mean. And then we can see what Paul says about them. So first of all, he talks about sin itself. Then he talks about sinful desires. And then he talks about our sin nature. So just to make this a little bit interactive, I've got a poll for you. OK, um, this first question here is about human nature. Are human beings born good and then corrupted by the world or are they born sinful? So you should have a little poll up here on your screen now and we'll have just a couple of minutes to uh, hear back as to what people think.
Okay, answers ticking in. Just wait for a couple more votes. Um, what we're getting is about 80% of people saying we're born sinful, 15% born good, and uh, the remainder saying they're not sure. Now, this is a slightly unpopular thing to talk about, actually, because our culture has this idea that human beings are basically good and that really if we could just stop ourselves from doing some of the bad things, really we'd all live in utopia. But the scriptures are, are really clear about this. And it's particularly clear in Romans 5, if you just cast your mind back to that passage that we had there about being in Adam and what that meant. The scriptures say that we are born with a sinful nature. What does that mean? Well, you may have heard it said that if a pregnant woman abuses alcohol or drugs, then the baby can actually be born with a chemical dependency to alcohol, drugs or whatever. And that goes on to affect their lives. They are themselves much more likely to become involved in destructive patterns of behavior. And, and in particular, they're much more susceptible to uh, developing addictions of their own when they grow up. That's medically true. We are born with the spiritual equivalent of that. We are born with a, a tendency to sin, which we have inherited from Adam, from our descendant from him, fr from our own parents. We are born with a, a natural propensity to sin. And so you'll find this if you, if you are yourself a parent, you don't have to teach your kids how to do anything wrong. In fact, you spend most of your time trying to encourage them not to or teach them how to do what's right, but they, you never have to tell them, oh, you know, it, it, sometimes it's good to try and break a rule or anything like that to you. They just, they just do it. And we are born with that. This is what's called our sinful nature. Out of that sinful nature are born sinful desires. So the desire to do what's wrong or the desire to not do what's right and this is most clearly laid out in its sort of its its purest and simplest form in Romans 1 where God says that people knew about God but they didn't consider that worth hanging on to and, and they exchanged the glory of God for idols they'd rather have their own self-imagined ideas than really know God and that is at the root of all the other sin that comes out so sin entered the world through one man we're all tainted that's Romans 5 and at its most basic form, it's the rejection of God in order to accept things that are not worth, um, not, not worthy substitutes, if you like. And then, so we have our sinful nature, we have our sinful desires that result from that nature. And then the end result of that, when it's fully born, is we do wrong things, we sin. And so that's what Paul wants to, to, to lay out here. We have a sinful nature, which gives birth to sinful desires, and then those in turn cause us to actually act on it and sin. So where does the law come in into all of this? Well, it is, again, going back to Romans 1, really clear that to exchange the glory of God for anything else is wrong. And, and we are all born with propensity to do that. But the trouble is that we don't really realise in our daily lives that that's wrong. If you stop somebody on the street who's not a believer in Christ and said to them, you know, do you know deep down that you're substituting the glory of God for idols and that it's wrong? <laughs> They'd look at you like you had three heads and say, what? <laughs> that doesn't compute. Because we have imbibed so much a godless culture from around us, people don't think like that. And so God, in his mercy, he says, look, that, that's invisible sin to you. You should know it. You should know that it's sinful, but, but you're so steeped in your worldview, you don't get that. So I'm um, he, he gives the law to show us in a visible way how we have this propensity to sin. Think of it a bit like this. We'll go back to our, our alcoholism as an example. You might have somebody who has an addiction to alcohol and they might really not want to own it. You put in place a law. You say, OK, come home sober every day this week. Even though that law might sound arbitrary, the result of it is that they realize their incapacity to live by the law. And because they're incapable of living by the law, the invisible sin becomes visible. And God gives the law in order to show people their inability to live rightly in the world. God gives the law in order to show our inability to live rightly within the world. The trouble with it is, Paul says, that it works. <laughs> it, it does work. And that's it's a good thing, but it... The negative side of it is you lay down a line and somebody wants to step over. He says, 
here that, you know, I wouldn't have known. Well, let me read the passage to you. This is, this is Romans 7, verse 7. What should we say? That the law is sin by, by no means. But if it hadn't been for the law, I wouldn't have known sin. I wouldn't have known what it is to covet if the law hadn't said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. So you see here, you, you put a line and say, don't cross it. And what's the first thing that somebody wants to do? They want to find out what happens if they do. And now they know there's a line. And, and this is the effect that the law has. So this leaves us with a real problem. It leaves us with a law that is intended to show us our inability, but cannot help us to overcome it. The best we can do, Paul says, this is in verse 16. He says, now, if I do what I don't want, I agree that the law is good. Now, that's the best we can hope for under law. We can get to the stage under law where we say, I realise that what I'm doing is wrong. Instead of, you know, I'm just blithely going about doing evil without realising it. We can get to the stage where we realise it's wrong, but we still do it. We cannot, by law, get free of wrongdoing. It doesn't stop us from sinning. It just shows us what that sin is. Now, if that all seems a little bit cerebral, and how does this actually apply? I want to now apply this. And this is where we start to steal a little bit into Romans 8, because the thing is, we can see Christianity sometimes as a bit of a, a new law. Jesus came and he said in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, don't murder, but I tell you, don't even be angry with your brother. If, you, if you're angry with your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look lustfully at a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. You've heard it said that anybody who, uh, I can't remember what the, what the phrase is that he uses, will be answerable to the Sanhedrin. But I tell you that if you say, you fool, then you've committed a sin. So Paul, uh, Jesus has laid out this, this kind of higher standard and we can come to Christianity and we can say, well, this, this is what Christianity is. It's this higher new law that's been given and we can live by it. But the trouble is that what that doesn't do is actually overcome the problem. A new law is not going to solve the basic problem in us, that law highlights sin but does not give us power to overcome it. And this is really important for us to grasp. We cannot go about our Christian faith as though we are simply just supposed to live by a new set of laws. Now, just in case it sounds like we're, we're dispensing with law altogether, and there have been groups in the past, they're often called antinomians, literally against law in Greek, who've said, oh, you know, that there's no place for moral teaching. You can basically do what you like so long as you believe in Christ. That's not what we're saying. But the moral teaching of Christianity has a place, a really clear place, which presupposes that we love God and that out of our love for God, we want to know how we should live to show that love. John 14 makes this really clear. John 14, 15, if you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commandments. Not if you obey my commandments, you'll love me. But if you love me, out of that flows obedience. So how do we live? Well, I want to ask one more question for interaction before we say that. There's this very famous passage, which I'm going to read to you now in Romans 7, where Paul talks about the struggle with sin. And he says this. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I don't want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. This struggle that he lays out of knowing what's right and wanting to do it, but seeming unable to, and, and knowing what's evil and trying to avoid it and seeming somehow still drawn to do it. Is he talking about 
life before he met Christ on that road to Damascus? Is he talking about the life before we come to Christ? Or is he talking about the ongoing struggle after we come to Christ? Or is it both? I'm going to ask that question now on the polls. See what you think. This one's much tighter in terms of voting. Right. So, so far, it's, it's more or less 50-50 between he's talking about his life since meeting Christ or he's talking about both before and after. If it helps you to, uh, to feel better about whatever you answered, commentators are divided on this one. So it's not as though there is one simple answer that everybody who has really read the text knows to be the case. However, there is, I believe, some leading within scripture to help us to understand this. You see, what he's talking about is an, is an old way of functioning under law. And so it clearly applies before he was born again, definitely, whatever else. Clearly before Jesus was, oh, sorry, Jesus, I, I apologise, before Paul was born again, he was living under law, desiring to do what was good and yet failing. But yet, even after that was the case, even after he encountered Christ, he still didn't immediately switch to living perfectly by the Spirit the whole time. And this is what Caroline alluded to last week when she spoke. This process of growing in sanctification, this process of growing in God. We don't become Christians and suddenly we are the finished product, but we continue to grow. And part of that is growing out of this old way of just living by rules and trying to live by the rules and allowing that to be what shapes our hearts to relating to God and our love for God shaping our behaviour. This is where Romans 8 is going to take us. Paul finds himself in a quite a desperate place at the end of this. This chapter ends with this sort of cry for help. Who will rescue me from this body of death? But thankfully there's an answer. God through Christ Jesus. And then he goes into Romans 8. How by the Holy Spirit. So Caroline last week said when we fall into sin as Christians, it damages our relationship with God. It also highlights that we don't fully love God. Fixing the symptoms doesn't fix the problem. What do I mean by that? I mean, we can try and fix the behaviour, but that doesn't necessarily get to the root of the fact that actually what it's highlighted is we don't fully love God. You remember, that's what law does. Law highlights the, the base problems in our hearts. So let's, let's park this with a, an example. Imagine that you're always upsetting your wife or your husband through words and actions. I'm going to say wife because then it sounds like it's me who's got the problems, which is probably true. Now, okay, you know you love her and you want to change. So she helpfully gives you a written list of things that she likes and dislikes. Brilliant, solid gold. Okay, you understand her better. You can start changing your behavior a bit. But as you go about making those changes, you start to resent it. Why should she be so demanding, so hard to please? Even though you know deep down that the list is helpful and right, you struggle. So some days it works and some days it doesn't. Some things on the list seem totally reasonable and you find them easy to change. Others are, oh, that's being fussy. It's a bit too much effort and they're left to last and, and don't happen. Because after all, with all the change you're making, she'll be less upset. That's a good thing. Surely she'll be happy with that. That's operating under law. It's taking the list of stuff that we want to do and not do and making that the goal. What, what Paul sets out here is that is not the goal. The goal is not just doing all the right stuff and avoiding all the wrong stuff. The goal is loving God and that love being worked out in then deciding to live to please him. What's needed in this example is for that person to discover afresh their love for their wife. And if they really love them, then none of the change is too much. You need the list so you know how to show that love, but the heart is what needs the primary intention, uh, the primary attention. And this is the case with us. If we struggle with sin, the answer is not simply to read our Bible more, to pray more, to read more books about God, to listen to more podcasts. They may be a good tool, but they're not the answer. The answer is for God to do surgery on our hearts so that we love him more. You see, we're headed for a destination, and the Bible talks about it in a number of ways, but one of the ways that comes up again 
and again and again is a wedding banquet between Christ and his church. We are created for love. We are created to be united perfectly with Christ forever. And he wants to work on our hearts now and prepare us now so that that is a joy that we look forward to daily. I want to be a person and I hope you want to be a person for whom the greatest joy that is ahead of us at all times is not something here on earth, um, you know, an, an achievement at work or a relationship that works better or a certain amount of, of comfortable lifestyle or whatever it might be. I want my highest goal, the thing that I look forward to more than anything else, to be unity with Christ, increasing now and one day perfectly and totally. We could see Christianity as a book that tells us how to live, basic instructions before leaving earth, if you like, the Bible. We could say, oh, but in addition to that, the Holy Spirit lives in us and reminds us how to live rightly. But both of those fall short of the true glory, which is that we have a companion, the Holy Spirit, who teaches us to love God more and more and more by showing us what he's like, showing us his nature, his character, through revelation, through reminders, through demonstration. One side effect of that is that we then try to live in a way that pleases him, i.e. by the rules and the laws and the principles that he sets out. That's what it means that we love because God first loved us. So Romans 7 doesn't simply tell us that we're sinful, although it does say that. It doesn't simply tell us that we can't live rightly by the law, but it points us towards this great way of the spirit that we're going to look at more next week. It points us towards a lifestyle in which instead of simply looking at a list of rules and saying, how can I live better? We instead call out to the Holy Spirit and say, change our hard hearts. Take away this heart of stone. Give me a heart of flesh that lives and beats for you. And as we do that, we then say, and God, I want to show that love for you in a fitting way. And thank you for laying out in your law all the different ways in which I can do that. I want to take hold of them wholeheartedly. But first and foremost, I am for you, God. I'm made for you. I am living for you. And I'm wholly yours. That doesn't come naturally. That's a work of the Holy Spirit in us. We've deliberately placed the sermon earlier on in the service. Um, today and the reason for that is that I'd like to provoke us and give an opportunity now and Dan's going to lead us through it in a bit to take some space in which we do business with God um, if that phrase is unfamiliar sorry that's that's a way that I talk about it and some people do what I mean is this to not only tell God what it is that you think and you have been challenged by but also to allow him to interrogate you the Holy Spirit asks questions of us. He provokes us. He challenges us. He says, this thing here, what does that show about your love for God? He says, this, this priority, is that really too high in your life? And out of all of that can come really positive life change. So that's where I want to leave us. Let's take some time in just a minute. And let's say to God, God, I'm yours. Holy Spirit, fill me. Show me where it is that my love for you is imperfect and change me. Help me understand and help me cooperate with that wholeheartedly. And God, I, I want to make that my prayer now as we close this section and move on to listening to you. God, please, would you be at work in our hearts? Please, would you give us hearts that love and beat for you? God, please, would you give us a right attitude towards the law and towards rules in which we obey them because we love you. And God, I pray for that direct channel with you, that direct access to you that the Holy Spirit gives us. God, would it be open for all of us now? Would we hear you? Would we be vulnerable with you and would you change our hearts? Amen.